Uh, thank you, uh, Ian. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, all the folks here at Waterloo. Jen is here somewhere. Hey, um, to all the students I've met, to all the students I will meet, and to other colleagues. Uh, I made the joke already, but I'm going to do it again. It's great to be back in sunny Ontario, uh, just in time for spring. Uh, I, I spent three years Whoa. here in Ontario. Really? Yes. I spent three years at London, uh, where it's probably snowing right now. So, uh, so glad to be here. Um, we're going to talk today about commercial content moderation. And it used to be that this would require a big setup uh, to explain what it is I'm talking about. Uh, I have a feeling in this crowd, that might not be the case. I also have a feeling that in 2019, in this moment, this is no longer the case. Um, it used to be that I would kind of start out by taking my phone and saying, you know how when you t snap a photo and you upload it to a social media platform, you know that process. But I think we all kind of understand now that what we're going to talk about today are people, human beings, whose work is to sit between us as content creators or others maybe sometimes more importantly as content creators, platforms and the dissemination of our content, our self-expression, information around the world. And that there are people, in fact, who work um, in this intermediary capacity between us, the platform, and the world. Um, this is now something that is kind of incontrovertible. But for a long time, in fact, when I would bring this up, people would, would doubt me and sometimes even accuse me of lying about this because internet companies would never ever do that. They would never put people in between me and my, uh, my free flowing information. Uh, the spoiler alert today is that actually they do. Uh, and it's possible that your free speech might not be their primary concern. So we'll keep that in the back of our minds as we talk today. Um, I'm very pleased to say that I can finally claim that there is a book forthcoming on this topic written by me uh, that actually exists as a physical object. I only had one of them, and I gave it to Kat and Ian. So I was going to bring it, but I gave it away. Um, but it will be out in, uh, in next month, in fact, and that the release date in Canada is the same for the US, which is June 25th. For once, um, Canada doesn't get screwed on this, <laughs> OK, frankly. Um, then, then what? Oh yes, no kidding. Um, the fact that it exists in the world made me feel like this is really happening uh, when I got the physical object, which was just about a week ago. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving towards sort of re fairly recent headlines, uh, in the past couple of years, it has become uh, difficult, if not impossible, for social media firms, and today I'll, I'll, I'll contextualize this by saying I'm speaking largely about US-based, kind of triple A, major social media firms um, that we all might be thinking about. So the, the Facebooks, the YouTubes, the Twitters, and so forth of the world, as opposed to um, your uh, board of preference, whatever that may be. Um, but at any rate, it became rather difficult for the firms to continue to uh, not speak to the fact that they employ people doing this work. And in fact, when, when this shift occurred in 2017, it was sort of on the heels of a number of political issues. In the United States, the election of Donald Trump. In the UK, the Brexit movement that uh, many people felt social media had played a nefarious role in or had been uh, gamed, in essence, uh, politically. And so there was a greater, uh, a greater criticism being levied to the firms on the part of the public and on the part of people in power, such as, uh, such as legislators and regulators, around, uh, around wanting to know more about the specificities of the way that information is created and disseminated online. And what was very interesting was that as these gaffes and 
incidents kept occurring, not only were the platforms acknowledging the role of human intermediaries in trying to stop the flow of such information, but they were really touting this workforce uh, as a key part of their solution toward that end. Now, if you've been following this industry, uh, you may know that there's another kind of panacea that's offered up frequently that is supposed to also do a similar thing and fix this in, a, in, a, in an automated fashion. Anyone know what I mean? AI. Yeah, AI, what other term? Algorithm. Algorithm, hand wavy, right? Algorithm, we're not sure what that means, but we're pretty sure it's computational and something, it'll do something, right? Okay, but in order to get there, I wanna take us back and I want to go back to uh, when I first began looking at this topic and give you a little bit of an idea of where things were uh, as this uh, phenomenon coalesced into an industry. And this was back in 2010. I was doing my PhD at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. So I was sitting uh, one summer day in the middle of this campus, which if you know anything about it, is surrounded on all sides by corn. It's, uh, in, it's an agricultural area. Uh, but it also is well known for computing uh, research. So you may know it for that reason. Uh, but I was, uh, I was teaching summer school and I was on a break having a cup of coffee and reading the New York Times. There was a small article within the New York Times that, uh, in, in about, I think it was in June or July, that talked about a group of workers who were working in nearby rural Iowa, just one state over, similarly in cornfields, and they were working in call center environments. When I, when I thought of this uh, kind of call center in, environment notion, in my mind, I never would have conjured up if asked someplace in Iowa. And the other interesting thing that was going on according to this, this brief article in the Times was that the workers in the call centers were not answering phone calls. What they were doing was looking at user-generated content being submitted to unnamed, unknown social media platforms and websites, many of which were engaged in, for example, e-commerce and maybe had product reviews or other ways for consumers to interact with that site. And these people in Iowa were being charged with kind of deciding on the appropriateness of this material in the context of those firms' own rules. In other words, what they were doing was a function of brand protection, first and foremost, for these unnamed companies. And they were doing this in an outsourced capacity. In fact, when I went to the website of the company that was profiled in the piece, at the time it was called Calaris, a made up word, of course, one of those corporate names. It's called something else now. It's had a couple of name changes. We know how that goes. But at the time it was, it, it was named Calaris. And you can see on their splash screen on their website, they gave us this image of a bucolic, agricultural, red barn silo, uh, rural Iowa. Now, even in 2010, that was a fantasy uh, because this is mostly agribusiness land and it's mostly massive corporate farms producing soybean and uh, hogs and, and uh, other kinds of products. This is sort of a relic. But certainly within their own branding, they were invoking and drawing down on the kind of the cultural resonance of this particular context. Furthermore, I mean, if that didn't hit you over the head enough, if I didn't convince you by the imagery, the, the, uh, the tagline says it all, outsourced to Iowa, not India. Okay, so for me, I felt like that was dropping the hammer, like outsource to Iowa, who's in Iowa versus who's in India. And for those companies that would solicit this kind of uh, work, the, the implication was clear. Come to Iowa, the people here share your corporate values, they understand you implicitly, you don't have to go around the world, um, you can do this at home, and in fact, Iowa, which is, uh, which is economically depressed and where people, people's work will come cheap, you can just outsource right here within the United States. Um, I was blown away by this story. At the time, I had been on the internet, my, my, my friends here can attest to this, for almost 20 years. 
Um, I had also had a career in information technology myself before going back to school, and I felt like I kind of knew the landscape more or less of this world. I knew the affordances and constraints. I'd watched it evolve into this kind of uh, economic juggernaut that it had become, and I realized I had never considered the problem, the problem of scale when uh, companies solicited on a nonstop basis user-generated content from its, uh, from its user base in order to draw people to the platform to participate. And it occurred to me, in just in reading that article, that of course there had to be a mechanism that they would create for intervention if need be. Like, of course, in the same way that when I go to a television studio and I explain the nature of the problem and I say to the reporter, how about we turn the camera on live stream here in downtown LA open up the door and invite anybody to come in and get in, in front of the camera. Would you guys do that? Does that sound like a good idea? And they're all like, no, of course not. We have sponsors, we had advertisers, we have, you know, our, our audience wouldn't like that. Well, same thing here. But the difference is that, of course, social media at this time was being touted as the mechanism by which everybody could go and engage and engage seamlessly. And certainly this harkens back to the principles of some of the founders of EFF, for one, about the nature of information and the nature of the internet and how um, any kind of intervention of the type I'm talking about would be constituted as, as, as censorship in such an environment. And here there was, in fact, evidence that an entire ecosystem was being developed to do just that. Maybe even more importantly, nobody knew about this. And by nobody, obviously I don't mean the people in the industries, but I mean those who ought to have been in a position to know. Because what I did after I read this is I started going around the campus, talking to friends and peers who were uh, graduate students as well, but also talking to my professors, talking to people not just in my domain, which was information science, but talking to people in communications and media studies, talking to people um, on the so-called North Campus side of things, where the buildings are a lot nicer, um, where I would go over and I went over to NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and tried to talk to some research scientists there. And to all of those people, I posed the question, have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of this phenomenon? And have you ever considered this, the nature of the problem that they're trying to solve? And 201, they said, huh, I never thought of that really smart people who were professionally engaged, sometimes possessing PhDs in these areas. The second thing they said was, don't computers do that? 2010. So the only person who didn't say that was the research scientist in the vision lab at NCSA. <laughs> now, what did he say? Well, I went over to him and I asked him about this problem and we were in a room, uh, kind of a, 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 a VR cube type of room, right? All, all black walls, totally controlled environment. And there was a wood table sitting in the middle of the space. So I was standing there kind of talking to him and laying out the, my thoughts around this and asking him questions and he nodded. He said, see that table? And I said, yes. I do see it. He said, well, right now we're working on the computer, getting the computer to reliably recognize that the table is a table. <laughs> Thank you, I love this crowd. I knew this crowd is gonna get it. Right, so this was 2010. Now I'm not here arguing that the state of computer vision has not advanced, okay? That's not the point. But, but the point is, those kinds of fundamental questions about like, can the computer know that a table is a table? What does a computer know? Another anecdote recently told to me what somebody in the industry said, remember, whatever the algorithm is doing, it's not watching the video. It's doing everything else but watching the video because that doesn't mean anything to it. All right, so all of this led me to the fact that um, there was something there. And as I started to think about it, again, based on my own internet experience as a community member and participant for many, many years, I knew that there was adjudication and debate and governance, whether it was the anarchy of some Usenet groups where anything went, to the draconian behavior of a particular uh, a BBS uh, wizard who kept the server in his closet and his decision making was <laughs> his way or the highway and everything in between, and you guys know who I'm talking about. <laughs> So it was everything in between, but that all constitutes governance. And more importantly, we were all volunte volunteering to participate under those rules. In essence, we had a sense of where the parameters were, and if we needed to know more, we could find out. 
We also probably knew who the people were who were making decisions in these cases. In this world of commercial content moderation, we're taking content moderation, which again I would argue has been going on since the net has existed, and it's at industrial scale. So I came up with this particular term to differentiate and to not be ahistorical about practices that have always gone on online since we've been social online, which is pretty much since the internet was invented. But it's to make the point that this is at a different scale and with diff to different ends. Um, I don't love this term, but it's the best I came up with and now we're stuck with it, so I use this. What is content moderation when we talk about it as CCM, commercial content moderation? It's the organized for pay practice of adjudication, reviewing, uh, and screening of user generated content posted to the internet, social media sites, websites, other online outlets, um, whereby individuals, human beings, sometimes with computer assistance, sometimes in other ways we can talk about, um, make a decision about its appropriateness and whether it should kind of stay up or come down. Um, it is now something that people do for pay, it's highly organized, and it's a global practice. Uh, this is a screenshot, for, that looks terrible, but you guys get the drift. It's a pull down menu from YouTube from a few years ago where the process of commercial content moderation would often start. It would start on the user side where someone like you or, or me would be online and experience a particular piece of content and have a problem with it and perhaps want to file a report on this. I'm not gonna ask, but anybody here ever filed a report on some content? You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it if you've done so. You've probably gone through some kind of triage process where you have to identify uh, what you consider to be wrong with the thing that you're reporting, and it might look like this. It might look like a decision tree. Uh, basically, this would kick off the, the process of that particular content going into a queue and being uh, looked at by some person who was uh, an expert in the particular platform or site's rules, terms of service, community standards, maybe any local laws that might be applicable, and so forth. Uh, and then the decision would be made to either allow the material to stand or perhaps to remove it. That's the most kind of uh, basic form of what I'm talking about. Obviously, we're talking across platforms and we're talking through time. So these practices really look varied. They are different at different firms. Um, different systems are involved and engaged in order to, to do these processes. Um, Sometimes it's been inconsistent or haphazard. In other cases, it's highly regimented and organized, and all of these kinds of uh, expressions of this exist. But what is certainly true at any of these major firms that rely on user-generated content is that commercial content moderation is a fundamental, mission-critical business practice for brand management. Other things are knock-on effects, like user protection, or well, community well-being or adherence to laws, but I would argue that it is fundamentally and it comes from a place of uh, curating and protecting the brand because these companies have relationships with, anybody? Thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> Advertisers, right, and they are in, invested and in, interested in keeping that relationship healthy and this is the way they do it. So I like to give this stat just to give you an idea about the scope and scale. This is one platform. Uh, 400 hours per minute, per hour, per day of UGC, and in this case, video content, being uploaded to YouTube. This stat is from about 2015. So are we thinking it's gone up or down in that time, right? Okay. Um, this is a screenshot from 2012. This was uh, up on the heels of the kind of the first public uh, scandal, very, very uh, kind of poorly covered. Most people didn't hear about this when some uh, contract workers working on digital piecework sites like Amazon, Mechanical Turk, or Upwork, um, some of those you may know, Odesk, Crowdflower, all these different ones that have changed names a million times, um, took issue with what they were being asked to do and they were asserting that they were becoming uh, upset, disturbed, um, depressed in some cases by the content they were seeing. This is something that Facebook released describing 
you know, frankly, what looks like some kind of a logic tree or, uh, uh, you know, if then flow chart type of thinking, which is sort of a way to um, put a computational thought process onto what is a much more complex set of decisions. But what I like about this is that it told us in 2012 information that I could not get from the companies, which was what is the nature of the content that people are taking down or that, are in, that they're being asked to review, more to the point. Well, uh, harassment, hate speech, spam, sexually explicit material, graphic violence, illegal drug use, self-harm, suicidal content, there's much more. Um, one of the complexities of trying to find traces of this work or trying to find evidence of the work going on on the site was that it's, it was very difficult to find an absence. In other words, to locate where there might have been material that no longer was there. Um, even when people were getting material taken down, they might not have necessarily have been a, a, aware of it or had a, a, a good explanation as to why that had occurred. The workers who were doing this, these tasks, and you can see here's where they were talking about where these folks were located as early back as 2012, Menlo Park, so we had people local. Austin, Texas, a big call center site for Facebook to this day. Dublin, another big tax haven for tech companies. And of course, in India as well. Outsourced to Iowa, not India, Facebook. Uh, you know, the workers who were doing this work, who were going through this, this logic chart, their, their task was really to decide whether content should be visible or invisible, while they themselves did their best to always remain invisible. In other words, the sign of being a good commercial content moderator was to leave no trace, was to get in and get out. This is where we see the huge difference, for example, in the kinds of in, in interactions that were going on in early internet communities where somebody might come in with a special badge that says, system wizard, I have deleted your post. Right? None of that was happening here. It was quite the opposite. Uh, furthermore, these workers were frequently um, under the aegis of non-disclosure agreements. Everybody here knows NDAs. You guys co-oping places? Anybody working in tech firms? Been asked to sign an NDA just to turn around and use the bathroom? I have. Yeah, anyone? No? OK. NDA, thank you. Thank you. Get the interaction. Yes, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. It's like, seriously, somebody once asked me to take a phone call with him, and he said I had to sign an NDA to take a phone call. It's part of the culture in Silicon Valley, to be sure, but there was more to it. For these workers, they were being precluded from talking about the nature of their work. Now, when the nature of their work put them in front of this kind of material all day, every day, you can see that being precluded from discussing it with someone is actually detrimental, right? Um, don't talk about the work outside work. It's, uh, you know, it's a secret. And we don't actually want people to know that we're hiring all these folks. Uh, because then some difficult questions will be asked, like who are they, where are they, and on what grounds are they making this, these decisions? So what I uh, went on to discover through, through the... How do you know they're not being affected in the bad way that they're trying to prevent? Exactly. Well, I would argue they are being affected in that very way. In fact, and that's what I went to research to find out what is the uh, impact on you as a worker, right, to, to be exposed to this material. And so that was my concern when I read about this, that boy, that sounds like a horrible job. Um, personally, I know when I see one piece of upsetting material, it can derail me. What happens if you're being asked to see it over and over again? So that's exactly what I wanted to find out. Of course, it was hard because I couldn't get the companies to let me talk to anyone. I'm sure you're surprised to hear that. Meanwhile, uh, I was poking around in various places looking for evidence of this work going on. And what I discovered was that, as I've already sort of indicated to you, it wasn't happening in one way in one site. Actually, the companies were using a fairly complex hybrid kind of strategy to meet the need around the issue of scale. In other words, YouTube could not hire enough people and have enough people on site covering uh, 24 by 7 uh, at their headquarters in Silicon Valley. Instead, 
They might, for example, have people in-house, but also hire uh, contractors in a call center somewhere, I don't know, in India, for example, the Philippines. They might outsource some of the work um, to micro-labor websites because of uh, the need for uh, additional support or backlog, for example. Other companies, maybe smaller companies who didn't have their own engineering capacities with, within their firms, companies that weren't tech companies by trade, were turning to what I call boutique firms who might offer services not only around content moderation, but they also might perform other kinds of brand and strategy, social media strategy management. So in some cases, in, in, in my book, I talk about a Canadian company, as a matter of fact, who is engaged in this way. Not only would they go in and delete content that was uh, harm, brand harmful, basically, which was often, uh, you know, the example I would give would be, you know, they were managing a Facebook presence for a cookie company, and suddenly people were posting homophobic things on the cookie company page. Because why? Because the internet, okay? Um, Right, and so they would go in and delete the homophobic comments on the cookie page. Well, when those comments were deleted, there was nobody talking about the cookie on the cookie page and tumbleweeds were coming through. So maybe somebody from that boutique firm would go in and say, gosh, I really love these Oreo cookies. They're, so, they're my favorite cookie. Never revealing, of course, that they're working for this boutique firm. So they were doing those kinds of things. Um, and then even in the case of in-house work, what I found was that the people being brought on site to some of these big firms in Silicon Valley were themselves contractors. So despite going to the work site every day, um, to and from physically being next to product development, um, policy teams, other kinds of folks within a company like that, they had this differential, lesser status of being contract employees and they were limited in term. I'm gonna start by talking about that particular case, and it's at a company I call Megatech. This is a pseudonym. Someone once told me in the audience, he Googled this name and was like, that's a trucking company. This is not the trucking company, Megatech. <laughs> this is a different company. Um, but what it is, it, Megatech is a major Silicon Valley uh, transnational corporation with many properties. And I was able to, you know, we don't have the time to get into it, but I was able to meet and talk to workers who were working on site at Megatech. Um, they were typically young people in their mid-20s, graduates of elite colleges in the United States and elsewhere. Um, unfortunately, they made the poor personal choice to major in things like history, economics, English. Uh, oops, I guess, right? This is a joke, you guys. <laughs> it's just kidding. Majored in the humanities too, yes. Um, uh, and so when they were offered the opportunity to work at a place like Megatech, despite not having a technical, particularly technical background, um, they were excited because it seemed like a foot in the door to a burgeoning industry. We afford a particular status to people working in these industries. Um, certainly at the time I began to talk to these folks, there was a sense that this was the way towards social and economic mobility. Um, again, American context, these students were graduating with massive amounts of debt <laughs> from places like Berkeley and uh, USC. Uh, and other liberal arts colleges. They were graduating with debt, and they were working in jobs like barista or pizza delivery immediately upon graduation. So the allure of taking a job at Megatech, even though the nature of the work was not fully being explained up front, and furthermore, nobody knew really what that was, even if they told them, well, you'll be a content moderator, that was fairly meaningless to folks at this time. You know, it seemed like a good gamble. And who can blame them, right? Um, in fact, I came to Megatech because I had initially tried to talk to those folks at Calaris that I told you about, in part because they were in Iowa. I was a grad student and I thought I can afford to drive. I can like afford the gas to get to Iowa and do research there, but I don't know about anywhere else. I couldn't get anyone there to talk to me after the piece in the New York Times ran. And I presume it's because there was a clampdown within the company of you know, workers kind of doing those kinds of interviews without permission. Um, 
Weirdly, Calaris started following me on Twitter at one point, so that was weird, but it's fine. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I came into contact with these workers at Megatech, and they were all um, at different stages in their work. So one of them has, had just finished his, his two years working at Megatech, after which the contract is officially terminated and you can no longer do the work. Another one was in the midst of it, and another had just begun. So I was seeing these folks at these uh, different uh, stages in their career. Um, yes? Why is it they have these limited contracts. Well, right. <laughs> uh, I think um, keep from damaging that's right. Well, it depends on who you ask. So if you ask, uh, I, there are a few answers. One is because I believe, I would argue, that both the firms like Megatech and the contracting firms supplying the labor knew that people were probably not going to be good at the job after a couple years, because they would either burn out or they would become desensitized, neither of which makes you good at this work. So that's the first reason. So I think you're right to be suspicious. You should be. Secondly, uh, you may recall or you may be aware that some years ago, almost 20 years ago, Microsoft got its butt sued handed to it for having contractors who were actually long-term, prov proven full-time employees who they would simply never hire. And so having this term limitation um, made, that imp it made it more difficult for employees to argue after the fact, I was a full-time, I was supposed to really just be a full-time employee. This was just a means to not give me benefits. And so that gets to the third point which is the relative um, inexpensive nature of contract labor, particularly in the context of the United States, where employment, full-time employment, is what gives you things like, thank you, lunch bunch. <laughs> yes, health insurance, exactly. Now, to, to your point, what do you do when your work makes you feel like you need to go to the doctor, and not just any doctor, but maybe a psychotherapist? and you don't have health insurance. Even when you have health insurance in the United States, mental health benefits are not particularly well covered. But in this case, um, some of my, some of my uh, 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 participants who were working at Megatech would joke with me and say things like, well, you know, we come to work, we're coming to the, come on the bus with all the other employees coming down from San Francisco, uh, the Wi-Fi on the bus, we all know about this. We come down, we have a badge. It's the wrong color badge because we don't get free sushi and we don't get to use the climbing wall. And they would joke about it. And they, these guys were situated right next to a climbing wall, but they weren't allowed to use it. And then later on they said, but see, we also don't have health insurance. We don't have benefits um, of any sort. Um, and so this was a big issue for them. And, and that sort of second class, second tier kind of status, even at Megatech, you know, that graded on them, especially when they knew how important the work that they were doing was and how taxing it was. Here's some words uh, from some of these folks. Again, these are pseudonyms, okay? Um, Max Breen, 24, he was the one who had just finished his two years and he was trying to move on. Um, they described it as kind of a revolving door. You would come in, you would hope that this was a foot in the door to get yourself up into the company of Megatech, maybe get hired on full time, maybe move into a different division. Uh, but by and large, at this time, it was a revolving door, and after two years, you were back on the job market, often at pains to explain what it was you had been doing for two years at Megatech um, in the larger market or how that might be a transferable skill. So, maybe you would go on to some other content moderation job for some other company. But as Max said, you know, you couldn't just leave it behind. You dwell on it. You go home, you think it's behind you, something comes up in your mind, you're kind of pulled back in. Um, obviously, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm just sharing with you the kinds of things that they told me uh, about the work that they were doing. And I want to say that I was very careful to not go for what's the worst thing you ever saw on the job or tell me about a traumatic incident because I knew it was just below the surface. And my actual biggest fear in doing this work was exacerbating that. So in fact, we would usually start conversations about 
the work that they were doing, and I'd say things like, tell me what makes you feel good about the work you're doing. And they would say things like, well, I know I'm doing this, so you don't have to do it, and that makes me feel good. I, I do this so you don't have to see what I see. And I think that makes a better experience for people out there. I know they can't handle it, but I can handle it. This is Josh Santos. He was actively uh, working as a content uh, moderator at Megatech, and he was, uh, had done so for over a year at this point. He described his workplace as being uh, like uh, immersing himself every day in a hole of filth. Um, not literally, because again, remember the climbing wall is right there, right? But psychologically, he had to be inside um, material that was by its nature, somebody else already objected to on some of the grounds that you saw. As I said, both Max and Josh would say things to me like, I feel good about doing this work because I can handle it. I'm a person who can take this. But then in other moments, in less guarded moments, they would say things to me like, since I came on this job, I really don't like to hang out with my friends who don't do this work. Because when we go out, everybody wants to talk about what they're doing at work, and I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to tell anyone. It's gross. Um, people won't understand. Also, I'm under an NDA. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Now, personally, I find when I go to a cocktail party and I start describing the work that I do, it's kind of a showstopper, too. People are kind of like, oh, OK, and they walk away. So imagine if you're on the front line. You don't want to go out with friends and talk about it. They also said things to me like, Max actually said this. He said, you know, uh, I was home one night with my partner, and we were on the couch, and she was becoming intimate with me and getting close, and I was getting close to her, and all of a sudden something flashed before my eyes that I had seen at work that day, and he described a, a pretty graphic, upsetting image, which I won't share. And he said, in that moment, I just pushed her away kind of stiff-armed her, like football, you know, pushed her away. And he said, the problem was I couldn't explain to her the words. I couldn't find the words, and I didn't want to tell her what the thing was that came into my mind during this intimate moment, right? So that's upsetting even to this day to talk about. Um, other things they were seeing, war zone footage. At the time, conflict in Syria is raging, and people are turning to social media platforms for advocacy to tell the world these things are going on in where we are, where the world should see this, to document this. But the frontline content moderators were often constantly reviewing material, uh, and each one of them that I talked to at Megatech brought up Syria as a particularly difficult situation they were contending with. All right. Uh, how, how long do I have? OK, great. So we're going to buzz through the next little bit. The next little piece I want to share with you is just some thinking about how did we get to Now that I've broken the room and everybody looks like, why did I come to this talk today? It's super depressing. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I want to talk about how did we get to a place where this makes sense as a form of labor? Right? Because this is what I think about a lot. And so I think it's import important to historicize this a little bit, because of course this feels new. But this is on the heels of, of some, some shifts in, in labor practice, particularly in North America, over the past 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, it goes by many names. We'll call it knowledge society for, for the time being. The notion being that um, there would be a shift in the way that people were working, right? Some of you recognize the scene, right? I see some not familiar nods in the back. Yes, anybody? Yes, that's right, IBM 360, right? Um, uh, so the idea is that we're gonna get deliverance from manufacturing, right? My grandfather worked on the same assembly line for 45 years. Never worked in a space like this. 45 years on an assembly line, hard work, physically demanding work, sometimes even physically harmful work. In fact, I believe he died from lead poisoning from the work that he did. Wouldn't it be nice if we could be delivered from the shop floor and use our minds, analytical work, engineering, scientific knowledge? What else is going on, by the way, in the 50s and 60s? Women are being pushed. Oh, that, well, that too. But that, what's new about that, you guys? Uh, how about geopolitically? Thank you. 
Cold War. So there's a race, right? This, this race for information, a race for scientific discovery. And the notion is that computation, digitization, uh, in, in some cases, other, other kinds of, of processes, automation, would help us uh, get there. It, we, this was called, in some cases, the post-industrial society, those of you who know the work of Daniel Bell, right? We would be shifting, in other words, our economic structure from a commodity-oriented economy to the work of the mind. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Deliverance from the shop floor, you don't have to work on the assembly line for 45 years, and <laughs> this is, yeah, and this is where we'll all end up, right? Well, California. yeah, California, right? This, this is probably Florida. Might be California. Um, my, my building does not look like this, just so you know. I don't live like this. Um, so, no, I'm not. I can't afford it as a UCLA professor. I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> great. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, so against that backdrop of these predictions about the shift to the analytical uh, uh, information society, there were a whole host of other kinds of economic shifts going on. Um, a shift for example, to notions of free market economics that for a long time had been considered fringe, right? Uh, that that was, this was kind of a movement coming out of the University of Chicago School of Economics. Thought about maybe trying, trying some of those ideas out in places like Chile. All right, okay, so we're there. And the hallmarks of such a philosophy, an economic philosophy and ideology had to do with things like privatization, deregulation, uh, uh, austerity measures, um, lessening control of the state in, in many ways. And so uh, we saw actually a cheapening of labor. We also saw this phenomenon of globalization happening. So when we talk about uh, deliverance from the shop floor and deliverance from industrial work for people in North America, for example, that work doesn't cease, right? Is manufacturing happening somewhere? It might not be happening where I lived in London anymore. And a very economically depressed city, by the way. Rust Belt kind of city. But it's certainly happening somewhere else, and it's chasing the lowest bid for that, right? We also have this going. I call it Uberization. We could call it the gig economy. There are a lot of words for this, um, where these new work forms, um, through a combination of those kinds of processes I described, plus technology. That melding of those things has led us to new work forms that we haven't necessarily seen quite in this way, but if we historicize things a little bit, might have antecedents elsewhere. An example, I just was in New York over the weekend and I took a tour of the Tenement Museum. Anybody ever been there? It's pretty cool. Recommend it. And I took a tour of an apartment where uh, some Russian Jewish immigrants lived at the turn of the 20th century, but they also worked in their apartment doing piecework, sewing work, piecework, right? So now what we're talking about, in many cases, is digital piecework, paid by the piece, paid by the ride you give, paid by the grocery delivery you make, right? Ever been to LA and seen the driving? Do you think Uber and Lyft have improved the circumstances for driving? No, it's scary. What are the characteristics of many of the firms that employ this kind of work? Well, workers are all contractors. There are no full-time employees. There are no direct employees. It's a contract relationship, right? Deregulation or just ignoring extant regulation, going into a city where there are laws about who can give livery service and being like, F you, we're going to show up here and just disrupt or Airbnb versus the hotel industry. I'm not here to tell you, by the way, that the taxi system is awesome and has been great. But, uh, it, you know, regulation can sometimes be nice, like when Boeing flaunts it and a bunch of planes go down, right? Okay. Uh, other kinds of characteristics, public good, the use of public good, the recapturing of public good for private gain. This is a big one. How much R&D that goes into these tech firms came out of state-funded universities. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods and back again there on that one, right? Yes, of course. Um, disruption maybe when it comes to worker protection, right? Um, 
That's just a few. And I would say CCM really does fall right into this. This is a, a Google bus stopping at one of the San Francisco public bus stops, and there being an action to disrupt that. Uh, because Google just thought it would be cool to cruise in and, uh, and use that infrastructure, obviously without contributing much to it financially. There have also been pretty significant reconfigurations uh, in, a, in a kind of a global economic context, right? P global geospatial political kind of reconfiguration. Going back to this notion of Iowa being in direct competition with India. So we see a new arrangement, and, and many scholars have talked about this. Iowa Ong comes to mind, David Harvey, others uh, kind of in critical geography studies. Um, these, these reconfigurations facilitate, again, this global flow of labor. So what we're now seeing is commercial content moderation traversing the globe. It's a 24 by 7 need. Uh, it's a need that requires particular linguistic and cultural competencies in some cases that can't be found en masse in certain places. It requires massive amounts of human labor, which is costly. And so CCM work is taking advantage of these kinds of reconfigurations, much like other businesses have, and are following uh, uh, pathways that have been laid to get this work to flow uh, in places that might be offering things like special economic zones, um, kind of tax-free havens where uh, countries create these extra state kinds of parts of their nation and ask uh, transnational companies to come in and make it very lucrative and attractive for them to do so. This is actually in Makati City in the Philippines in Manila. Anyone familiar with the Philippines here? It's okay. It could be Manhattan, could be Toronto, right? Looks like a global city. Um, so that takes us to the Philippines, and I'm just going to buzz through this a little bit just to let you know that the Philippines in 2013 surpassed India as the call center capital of the world at a tenth of the population of India. That isn't per capita, it's, it's raw numbers. So the Philippines um, at that time and, and for a long time now has been leading in what's called the business process outsourcing, BPO industry, where much of commercial content moderation does take place. We call them call centers colloquially. Uh, the Philippines actually has an entire ministry devoted to soliciting international uh, business, and it's not limited to information technology or computing, but that is a particular area of focus for the Philippines. Uh, and since uh, over the past few decades, that IT uh, uh, specialty has become more and more important in the Philippines in terms of um, uh, its, its own orientation in, in what it's seeking from, uh, from international business. This is actually from a deck that they were using to, to kind of do uh, Q&A sessions. So, somebody just sighed. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Philippines as raw diamond. There is no graft or corruption in the Philippines. Boom. Trust us. Also nowhere else. Definitely not in the United States or Canada either. Um, this is as of 2013. The, you obviously cannot see the, the specific names, but this just gives you a sense of how many of these zones there are. Not all of them are the IT zones. Um, uh, there are other ones as well, but you can see how important that is economically to the country and how they are located all across the islands. This kind of economic development has led to a great deal of unevenness in infrastructure and in, in the economy there. This is called the Bonifacio Global City or uh, uh, BGC, which is a place I visited. You can see it's kind of a mixed use space. You can see uh, many places under construction. This is a, a high-end shopping district, and this is where many of commercial content moderation companies based in the Philippines are located. This used to be Fort McKinley. This was a military base where the United States, when it occupied the Philippines, had its seat of power. When that, uh, that military occupation ended, this was a military base for the Filipino army, and it is now the center of uh, uh, economic activity. And you'll have areas like this in this Metro Manila area next door to areas like this. 
and this is what I call the paperless office, okay? Now, I wanna to say too that when I make this distinction, this is not somehow uh, exclusive to Asia, to Southeast Asia or to East Asia. I live in Los Angeles, and I can go from one neighborhood to another and see this kind of economic disparity as well. But it is absolutely being exacerbated by these policies that invite in special economic zones. And so now, as I said, we have uh, the Philippines leading in BPO work. These are call center operators working in places like this, Eastwood City, another uh, similar, this was actually the first special economic zone dedicated to IT work in the Philippines uh, in 1995. Looks a bit like Disney, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of shopping goes on there and just kind of like uh, um, communal activity of a variety of types. So the Philippines as the center for BPO work, it's not, it's, it has not sprung up overnight in a vacuum. In fact, I saw this map from 1923 that was articulating uh, the, uh, the, tr the patterns of, of shipping lanes going to and from the Philippines. It also might be interesting to overlay undersea cables to and from uh, Canada and the United States to the Philippines. Um, because the, the trajectory of the digital labor that's flowing, in fact, we could lay right over this as well, right? But it's gone somewhat from the material goods, although that still happens, to uh, this, this kind of immaterial uh, work being what is flowing and what is, what is, uh, what is bringing uh, capital to and from. And we have companies springing up now in the Philippines that are BPOs but specialists in CCM. This one, uh, uh, micro, microsourcing, is located in the BGC, where we just saw. And they tell us on their splash screen, Filipinos have excellent language skills, understand Western slang, and have a great eye for detail. Yes, all Filipino people have a great eye for detail. So hire them to do CCM. They all have great capacity with English uh, slang. Why? Well, because of this colonial relationship, right, for years and years. And so you should hire them. They offer uh, also something called virtual captives. I don't know, you guys, that's what they call it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, but the, the idea here is that you can quickly build up, ramp up a technically competent team. Th these might be coders down here or they might be CCM workers. You can ramp them up quickly, execute them, put them on a, on a contract and execute the contract, not execute the workers, execute the contract and then if you need to close shop, you can do that instantly too. Or if it becomes more cost efficient to move your contract to India, which is something the workers are always worried about, you can do that too. Um, and this is what uh, a, a participant in the Philippines told me. He, despite working in this, in this world for a couple years, he felt insecure all the time. Anytime that contract can come and, and your work can go. Um, another, another comment, first you have to handle the ticket for 32 seconds but because they increased volume because of fears of the contract being taken away, that was cut to 15 to 10, sec uh, 10 uh, seconds to review a piece of content. So that was the metric that was being used to evaluate workers. Another way to read that might be doubling the production for no pay change, right? Or having the pay. What is at stake? A whole bunch of stuff, but I'll end with a few thoughts. Uh, this is a central and mission critical activity to these firms that employ this work. But it has historically been little known, little discussed, uh, and it's typically been workers who are remunerated for low wage at low status. I hope I've convinced you that it reflects and relies upon these new labor forms that are problematic in my opinion. It's globalized, outsourced, and precarious. You can also be outsourced in your own country of origin as well, whether that country is uh, Canada, whether it's the United States, whether it's India, wherever. It puts workers in difficult and dangerous working conditions, even though that might not be physical. We do not have any longitudinal studies that tell us what the impacts are of doing this work two years on, five years on, 10 years. There will be a bill that comes due at some point. Companies are averse to doing that research. They know it needs to be done, but they don't want to do it because knowing means having to respond. So they avoid it. Uh, 
it unveils this legion, of course, of human workers that have gone pretty much unheralded, and when many people have assumed that the work has been fully or almost fully automated for a long time. And finally, maybe for this crowd, this is a good one to end on, it troubles the notion of the internet as a free speech zone and as a site of seamless democratic intervention. It really changes the game when we think about all of these people making decisions pretty much on behalf of the firm or other clients uh, without our knowledge in any way. Or how would we, if you have a piece of content taken down, how do you, how, how do you ask for an appeal of that? To whom do you appeal? Uh, if you want to know who the editor-in-chief is of a particular part of Facebook, can you look on the, on, open the page up and look on the, on the masthead? No. I guess Zuck? I don't know. I don't think he wants to be that. Um, so this is just some food for thought. I'll leave it here. I have two million slides, so I could go for a long time, but I'm going to run out of time, I believe, so we want to cut it. But, um, this is just a little bit of food for thought. This is hardly comprehensive in terms of what's at stake, but what I wanted to do today was introduce you to thinking about this and also ask you, um, as you go forward, and so many of you are going to actually be leaders in the, in the tech world and uh, have input and have insight, uh, ask you to be aware of um, all aspects of the impacts of the work that you do. I mean, there's a reason these folks are not on the regular payroll, because these are lean firms, right? They're lean, that's what, uh, that's what the investors want. They wanna see low overhead when it comes to labor, right? And they don't wanna have these kinds of costs come due. I'll close with the story of one woman who used to work at this like fly-by-night deal called MySpace. Anybody remember MySpace? <laughs> Well, for a time, it was a very important uh, uh, platform, and she was working in LA as a content moderator, commercial content moderator for MySpace, and also a trainer on that issue. She's now a bookkeeper. She deals with ledgers and numbers all day, every day. Um, that's her preference now. And we were talking about the work that she used to do, and she said, well, you know, uh, after I quit MySpace, after it kind of like whatever, moved out of that work, I would meet people and I wouldn't shake their hand for about three years after I did that. She kind of looked at me knowingly, like that would make total sense and I should just get it. Well, unfortunately, I've been around this world long enough where I did get it, but I did ask her to say more. And I was like, well, what do you mean when you say that? Why? why? And she said, well, because I've seen people and they're nasty and I know what they do and I don't want to touch anyone I don't know, right? And that was her just walking through the world every day, fairly undamaged, right? But that was kind of the cost for her. And before she came, before we got in touch and we started speaking, she said, you know, I've never told anybody about this work that I did. Uh, her name is Roz Bowden. You can find her in the book that I wrote. And um, I guess I'll just close by saying I'm grateful for the people who do this work so I don't have to do it. And uh, I hope you'll take that forward. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, a, colleague, uh, a colleague of mine, so the comment was that the, this reminds the audience member of The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. For those of you forced to read that in high school, we all remember that. Maybe we went off meat for a while after reading that book. Uh, a compliment was uh, recently paid, well, a colleague recently described my work as being muckraking in the best sense of the word. And he meant it as a deep compliment, and I took it as a deep compliment. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about in terms of uh, the sensationalistic aspects of this work, and it's easy to kind of fall into a place of, of only dealing with that. And it's something I have seen, um, as, uh, unfortunately, some journalist peers have kind of gone that route. Others have taken a, a longer view. I think it is important to talk about the salacious parts, the really disturbing parts to a certain extent, but hopefully to bring people in in the same way that I think Sinclair 
showed us so much of the disgusting side of things to make a broader point about justice for workers and about social conditions um, that made certain kinds of work uh, and the logics behind them make sense. Um, so I take that as a great compliment. So thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.